Chapter 14, Hori Survives Shipwreck. The planes hustled down, attacking the middle ship, now obscured by smoke, drenched by water spouts. The planes flattened out over the masts, their machine guns blazing, but they had dived into a hail of rifle fire, and one machine hurtled straight on with a terrifying crash into the sea. A roar of U-Butte burst out above the rifle fire, while cheering drifted across to us from the attacked ship. Look out, they're coming, someone yelled, as planes came hurtling at us into a hail of lead, from which each in turn violently swerved as its bomb fell harmlessly into the water. The row was deafening as attack after attack developed, even revolvers and anti-tank guns were fired against those gleaming demons. Wacko, a lad, shouted, See, that one slew off. The stokers did it. They're throwing lumps of coal up the funnel. In the laughter I saw chips flying from the mast, while even the wire rigging was frayed and nicked by bullets. The gamest man must have been the man away up there in the crow's nest, staring at the onrushing planes while shouting advice and waving his arms in encouragement to the gunners below. Plane after plane came diving apparently straight at him. He had no time to be thrilled because everything was happening too quickly. High on that swaying mast, he stood a hurricane of bullets whistling up from the decks passed by bullets hissing down from the planes. The wind from the screeching machines waved back his hair. On our decks were packed four thousand men shooting upwards when above the den the piano in the saloon broke out in a rousing tune. A hearty chorus with the wog dog energetically barking approval. Thus, the boys who had lost their rifles cheered us on with piano and song. A terrifying roar drowned all sound as another stuka crashed violently into the sea. A lovely, terrible sight. Then came a gust of laughter at the wog dog up on the sun deck excitedly barking at the waves, swallowing the plane. The hot reception drove the enemy from us, and the planes again concentrated on the center ship, which was blotted from sight by spray from a stick of bombs. But the fire there also was too hot, and the enemy bombs exploded harmlessly in the water. For hour after hour, the planes came in screeching attack until by midday we had shot five down into the sea. A Lucas lamp from the bridge of the center ship flashed us the signal. Congratulations on the volume of small arms fire. Good show. Keep it up. And we did, with the destroyers at full speed concentrated furies of sound. When the bright sun was high in the sky, the enemy got our ship. The planes came like comets hurtling out of the glare, and we could not see them until they flattened out directly above the mast. Even they failed to hit us, but one bomb screeching down raised the hair on my head. It burst overside with an explosion that rocked the ship while a mountain of water belched up over the port. Quarter. The rigging came clattering down. Had that bomb hit the deck, it would have turned us into a charnel house. Our ship had fought the good fight, but in that last split-second decision made one little mistake. We had zigged when we should have zagged, the engines stopped, the firing ceased, an uncanny silence enveloped us. The plane had vanished 
It was their last bomb. Very fortunately for us, the troops remained quietly at their posts. The destroyer defender came racing beside us, and a voice called through a megaphone. What is the matter? We've run out of petrol, yelled a soldier. Above the laughter came a quiet voice from our bridge. Ship, badly hold. Six feet of water in the engine room. Engine moved off its mounting. We'll take off the troops, came from the destroyer. Immediate, quiet action followed as the destroyer came alongside. The ship was to be abandoned. In an instant, I was jumping along the forecastle deck, trying to get to Hori. Only then I noticed the alarming slant of the crowded decks. Already boats were being lowered, rafts thrown overboard. With considerable difficulty I reached the worried fog dog. Your first shipwreck, Hori, I said consolingly as I picked him up, but we'll see it through, never fear. He wagged that apology of a tail and tried to lick my face as we slid rather than walked down that rapidly growing list to starboard. Troops already were scrambling down onto a destroyer. I dared not let myself think what would happen should the enemy planes return. From the sun deck to the destroyer was a 20-foot drop. Troops were sliding down ropes while the little destroyer below was sickeningly rising and falling with the swell. The big troop ship at times seemed to be leaning right over the destroyer. She was sinking rapidly. I'd discarded my great coat and had nowhere to put Hori and leave my hands free. Catch my dog, I yelled down to the destroyer. Okay, dig, let him go. And Hori dropped through the air towards grinning faces and up upheld hands. He twisted and turned, but was expertly caught, his little face turning up towards me. Laughing at his fright, I slid down a rope and was grabbed by those below while Hori tried to lick my face off. I put him out of the way in one of the destroyer's lifeboats, then hurried to give a hand with the ropes, down which troops were swarming like lines of monkeys. In the nick of time, I noticed a lifeboat coming down from the troop ship. One end was slipping as the destroyer was beginning to rise from the swell. I leaped towards Hori's lifeboat and snatched him out just as the two boats smashed together. It was a close call for Hori. In less than half an hour, every man had been taken from the stricken ship, while the destroyers were circling the water, picking up swimmers and men clinging to rafts and lifeboats. Then we were steaming full speed for Crete. We wondered why the enemy planes had not returned while we were helpless. Probably their base had run out of bombs. They did not catch us up again until we were landing at Suda Bay, Crete. We had lost our rifles on the ship, but the, the destroyers kept the planes off with a terrific barrage while we leaped ashore and ran for it. Hori was so pleased at being on solid earth he did not race ahead for cover, but ran with me, barking and leaping at my flying legs. Urged by machine gun bullets whipping up the ground, we dived into a cutting and gasped for breath while the planes roared past. I was stroking Hori when the, sta the sound of running feet and panting warned me to dodge two hurtling bodies. Made it, gasped Popa's triumphant voice above Hori's frantic barking. Are you hurt, gasped Don. No, for the love of Mike, 
Don't say this is Hori. Hori was kissing Popa and Don in turn. I thought you'd make it, laughed Don as he petted Hori. Yes, with a little luck. Where are the boys? We don't know, but think and hope they're all right. What with that night on the beach and the crowd and the hurried embarkation and sunken ships, boys in all units have been scattered everywhere. There's a transit depot established somewhere, said Popa. We'd better set out and find it. We found it among the hills, just outside the town of Kenya. The troops were rolling in, in two and threes, and groups of twenties and hundreds. They were a sorry sight. Some were practically naked. Many were without boots. Some appeared to be ragged, half-soldiers, half-sailors. These were the men from sunken ships. Those whose ships had been sunk under them had lost their rifles. Under an olive tree we enjoyed our first good meal and cup of tea for many days. Hori is eating like a horse, said Don. You must have starved him. The sailors on the destroyer gave the little wretch plenty, I protested. But Hori raced away with wagging tail and frantic barks. Hooray, shouted Popa, Feathers and Gordy and Fitz and Murchie. Surely now the devil does look after his own. It was a happy little party of rebels that sat down under the olive trees and feasted and yarned. We'd all had our adventures, plenty, but just weren't they glad to see Hori. If anything happened to him, it would mean the end of the rebels. Laughed Feathers. The end of the war, declared Popa. The troops simply could not get along without Hori the wog dog, and he patted the little fellow's head. The quaint little dog, as usual, lapping up the petting. I notice you're admiring our fashion plate, grinned Murchie. I had been smiling at feathers. How he did it, I don't know, but despite all he'd gone through, he was moderately neat and tidy, just moderately. I think I'd better scrounge a bit more tucker for hoary, I said while the going is good. Keep an eye on him. I strolled to the cook house, and the cook was obliging. While I was returning to the boys, a voice yelled, Hey Jim, I've got your dog. In surprise, I turned round to see Bless Jeffers walking towards me. He'd joined our unit shortly before we left, Egypt for Greece. But his was a different job to ours, and we hadn't seen much of him. I wondered what on earth he meant about Hori. I thought it was some joke. I saw the little fellow looking terribly alone in the confusion when the Costa Rica was going down, he said. So I picked him up and managed to get him aboard. A destroyer. I've got him over here. I felt sure I'd run across some of you boys when events sorted themselves out. I followed him across to some olive trees, feeling very curious. There he is, or rather she, said Les triumphantly. For a second, I was too astounded to speak. Tied up under a tree, a picture of misery, appeared the living image of Hori, but in a flash I noted the slightly different expression, the long tail, the ears not quite so perkily pricked, and she was a lady dog. Well, I'm blessed, I exclaimed. What's the matter? Les asked, for the little dog lay there gazing at us very timidly. It's not Hori, I said, but it's almost the dead spit of him, the same breed, too. 
and I used to think there was not another dog in the world like Hori. I'm sorry if I've taken someone else's dog, said Les. You haven't. She would have gone down with the ship if you hadn't rescued her. I wonder if she belonged to one of the crew. They were fearfully busy getting us off the ship before she sank. Perhaps her owner was hurt. Maybe that's it, said Les. Well, look here. You'll have all your time taken up looking after yourself. I've an idea. We are going to be kept pretty busy on this island. What if I take the dog to the rebels? There are a crowd of us to look after her until we locate the crew of the ship. They came off in the destroyer too. Goodo said less, and I knew he was relieved. It was the funniest thing out, the meeting of Hori and Horietta. Hori at his fullest, tiny height, with stub tail, stiff as a ramrod, showing off his paces to the bashful girl. Dog. Hori doing all the manly stuff, insisting upon winning her confidence, and then with tail erect, trotting away, to show her round the place. After just the right amount of masterly coaxing, she followed meekly and obediently. So that's that, declared Popa. Are you fellows going to set up a menagerie? She's a new addition to the two we started with, grinned Murchie. If you mean that for me, my lad, began Popa, but the returning planes cut argument short. We dived for cover in time to see Hori leading the terrified Horietta into a foxhole. The countryside around Kanea was delightful, with groves of olive trees and vines and little farms among hills overlooked by mountains. The island of Crete lies across the eastern Mediterranean as a mountain mass about 170 miles long and approximately 20 wide. All land possible is cultivated with numerous olive groves, barley fields, and grape vines. The frugal Cretans have even leveled terraces out of the sides of the hills which appear like enormous steps covered with a green carpet of vine. The folk were very friendly, and though their island was not well stocked with food, they offered us the luxuries of fruit and eggs, and wine, meals fit for a king, especially after the hard biscuits and bully beef, which had been our fare for so long but that this peaceful scene was to be peaceful no longer was hourly obvious. The bombing attacks grew in intensity, mild forerunners of the terrible fighting soon to take place, before the enemy overwhelmed Crete. Hori and his girlfriend got along famously together, and were rarely separated. In the bustle of her preparing for defense, there was no such events as ordinary parades, but at such times as the battalion marched out on a job, Hori and Horietta trotted at the head of the column, looking very important. Put the bombing terrified Horietta, she was pathetically frightened, trembling violently for long after each raid, despite all we could do to soothe her. She had obviously been very well looked after aboard ship, and, no doubt, at each alarm, had been rushed down below to some quiet hideout. But here was the open earth, and the crash of the bombs nearly paralyzed her with terror. If we can't do anything with her, said Popa at last, it would be better to put her out of her misery. Kind-hearted old Popa, we might be forced to do it, 
might have to draw lots as to who must shoot her. We would not see any of the ship's crew again. We'd heard they were immediately shipped to Egypt to man another ship. The Germans are going to land here, said Fitz, and the fighting will be hellish. Sooner or later, we'll have to do something about her. Perhaps we might get some Cretan family to take her, said Gordy, hopefully. That's it, exclaimed Popa. All hands keep an eye out for some Cretan family that's willing and will be kind to a dog. But Horietta simply could not get used to the bombing. During the violent tremors, Hori tried his best to soothe her, licking her face and prancing around her and trying to coax her to lie still. Again and again, he'd lead her to a foxhole shelter of his very own, trying to explain that she had only to run and dive in on the first sound of the planes. But Horietta continued to live in misery during the air raids. Chapter 15 The Wog Dog to the Rescue One day brought us a pleasant surprise. A visit from Archie and Bash, Murchie's New Zealand commandos. They had located their own battalion, which had camped quite close to us. We enjoyed a great yarn, Murchie especially reminiscing with the Kiwis about their bush-ranging adventures with the Greeks. Succeeding days, when duty allowed, often found the two New Zealanders yarning with the rebels. Alas, in the desperate fighting soon to rage around Malim Airfield, both Archie and Bash were killed. By this time, Horietta had fallen for Hori in a big way. She was his shadow and gazed at him with gloating eyes while he proudly strutted before her. Though a quiet, timid little thing, still she was spiced with a touch of vixenish ways. She deliberately tries to make him jealous, grinned Gordy. One day, when the innocent Horietta did her stuff and was the center of attraction, with mild, bashful eyes, she was sitting back on her tail, a trick the ship's crew had evidently taught her. She was a little adept at sitting up and would not move until we had petted her and ordered her down again. Hori stalked round and round her with cockeyed interest, trying hard to imitate her. But his efforts only brought discreet grins. We daren't laugh aloud, for Hori's tail was too short. He simply could not sit back, for his long body overbalanced every time. Horietta, on the other hand, could get a firm purchase with her long tail. You're not in the race, Hori, grinned Marchie, and Hori, being a wise dog, desisted from efforts which only made him ridiculous. In cute little ways, Horietta let us understand she too liked her share and more of petting. Demurely, she would gaze at the ground when Hori's growl warned she was claiming too much of it. One evening, Popa returned to camp, looking somewhat downcast. We've got to hand in our rifles, he growled. Popa had boasted that among so many weaponless men, his rebels still had their rifles, despite shipwreck, or anything else. Now we were asked to hand them in, for every weapon was urgently needed. Our full-time job would be signaling. Dawn Company are all right, said Popa enviously. They landed without shipwreck, 
and their machine guns and rifles are intact. They've got to fight it out with the rest of the boys, but signal units poorly armed have to concentrate on signaling duties. An airborne attack on Crete is imminent. We're moving soon. Our job will be to keep communication between small striking forces and company headquarters. That's serious, I said. There must be some thousands of men here now with no equipment at all. Much worse than that, replied Popa. We cannot replace the lost material. Every possible man will be desperately needed soon, but every man without arms will be an encumbrance. Next morning, the Luftwaffe heavily attacked the shipping in Suda Bay. Hori scooted for cover, barking to Horietta to follow, but she trembled so violently that she could not move. We must get rid of her, said Popa shortly. Today is your last chance to find her a home. We leave camp for action stations tomorrow. We located in a little Cretan home among the hills some kindly folk who immediately took to Horietta. The shipwrecked pup would have a good home. We did not let Hori know her whereabouts lest he should go AWL. It was well that we solved the problem, for food became very scarce. Hori was to lose a lot of weight. He was from now on to scrounge for his tucker, to sit patiently in front of soldier after soldier, receiving any small portion of biscuit or bully beef the donor could spare. Our rations were cut to the bone, but he adapted himself so willingly to hardships and was always so bright and contented that his show of guts helped lighten our own troubles. Our new quarters overlooked Suda Bay. Small bands of our troops were occupying a steep rocky hill overlooking the bay and their duty was to watch for and deal with any paratroops that soon were expected to attempt a landing. Our particular job was to keep communication between these scattered patrols and headquarters at the bottom of the hill. By daylight, we signaled in Morse using a flag, a white singlet tied to a stick, but at night we had neither signaling lamps nor even torches. We dare not have used them anyway for fear of spies and fifth columnists, and yet a vital message might be received at any moment. Important messages were arriving all through the night, our only means of getting a message through. To headquarters was by runner down a long, treacherously steep and rocky hill. A slow method when minutes might prove vital. Hori solved it. He became our willing runner for night messages and could get down that hill much faster than any man. By day, Hori and I worked with a patrol that occupied the hill immediately above headquarters. Just before dark, I would leave Hori with the patrol and scramble away down the hill to the hollow olive tree where I slept near headquarters. If the patrol received a message from distant patrols, it was written down, securely tied in a handkerchief, and fastened to Hori's collar and away he would scamper down the hill. I'd wake up to feel him urgently licking my face, and the message was immediately delivered to headquarters. To let the patrol far above know the message had been delivered, Popa would fire two rapid shots 
airwards with his revolver. Hori delivered quite a number of messages, no matter how dark or stormy the night. Not one message entrusted to him ever went astray. A day came when we were stunned by the news, even though we were partly expecting it, of another evacuation. All those troops without equipment, all British and Imperial troops whose equipment had been lost were to be evacuated, but for the unavoidable loss of equipment of those thousands of men, a different story might have been told of Crete. But imagine what we felt at not only having to leave the Greeks behind, but our own mates as well. I packed Hori into an empty ammunition box, for there was no foreseeing how troops might become separated in a ticklish operation like this. Some hostile officer might spot Hori and order the dog be left behind. The increasing raids of the Luftwaffe told us the dawn of the first great attack was perilously close. Everything was going smoothly until the Stukas appeared just as we were embarking. The familiar warmth of the bursting bombs started hoary growling. Urgently I ordered him to keep quiet. An ammunition box being carried aboard ship was quite in order, but not with a bark inside it. I gained the gun deck aft and glancing round saw a large tarpaulin and let Hori out of the box. The raid still thundered on, and I must have looked silly sitting upon deck quietly talking to a small bulge under the canvas, but those not in the know merely thought I was bomb-happy. When we raced safely away from harbor, I let the little dog out to see upon what new adventure he had embarked. A 10,000-ton transport, the Lousy Bank, now bound for Port Said. Next day, we shared our last bully beef with Hori. We could expect no more until we reached Port Said in about three days' time, providing we successfully ran the gauntlet of the Luftwaffe. We had an unexpectedly good trip, and we bombed, were bombed only once more. They came at us out of the sun, to the explosion of a stick of bombs, splinters whizzed across the deck, water came splashing up, the planes flew away. I noticed the little dog limping. He's hit, exclaimed Popa. A small steel splinter was embedded under the skin on his shoulder. It's only a blighty, laughed Don in relief. Hori, you old scoundrel, I believe you were only maneuvering for a spell. Hori wagged his tail as if he'd accomplished something great. We commenced the operation immediately. I pinched the skin while Don dug the steel splinter out with a knife blade. Hori did not whimper. He licked my hand and wagged his tail. We've made a good job, Hori, said Don, and showed him the splinter. If only he had Horietta here to nurse him, said Fitz. Perhaps he's safer as he is, remarked Popa reminiscently. Tell us the romance, old war horse grinned Marchie. Go to blazes, answered Popa when we disembarked at Port Said. The boys crowded round me while I carried Hori under my arm. Once aboard the train, he was allowed what freedom a crowded cattle truck could offer. His wound was troubling him, 
So we took the field dressing off, and he licked the wound to rights. He forgot his troubles when he heard the voices of the Arabs and immediately challenged them in no uncertain manner. He's got a long memory, said Gordy. They must have given him a tough spin some time. From Kentara on the canal, we entrained across the Sinai Desert, over which our troops had fought their weary way during the last war. Those great fighters would hardly recognize that terrible desert now. A railway runs through it and a pipeline with water. There are stations and in places cultivation. Not in their wildest imaginings would the mounted men know the desert. <clears throat> Seeing what has been done with one of the most terrible deserts in the world made many of us wonder why we do not do a great deal more to develop our own interior, which of course could not be compared to a true desert like this. We traveled straight on into Palestine and camped at Deir Sunid. To an excited yelp from Hori we saw the towering form of Big Jim and the Gog coming to welcome us. He's lost quite a lot of weight during his soldiering, laughed Big Jim, as he petted Hori, but will soon alter that, and he carried the pup away. He soon returned with a parcel, which he opened before the ravenous Hori. Officer's mess, quoth Sergeant Popa, with a hungry glance at the good meats. Big Jim only laughed. Some officer would go short, of a good meal that day. He's grown quite a lot, said the Gog, as he opened a bottle, and we gathered round and celebrated. Big Jim and the Gog had the rebels' camp already, and had somehow scrounged a few bottles to do it in style. Hori thought he was the guest of honor, sitting in the tent, listening to our reminiscences, and watching the expressions on the faces he knew so well. So Hori is a little Anzac, said Big Jim in a proud voice. Hori stood up and marched to the tent door on guard. Wogs exclaimed the gog, and Hori growling fiercely dashed out to chase the suspected Arabs. He's home again, laughed Murchie. His belly is well lined again, grinned Fitz. He's ready to soldier on immediately. It was late that night when Big Jim and Sergeant Popa retired. Reveal at daylight, grinned Big Jim. Like hell, we, were, we replied in one voice. I see the rebels are back, laughed Big Jim as he walked out into the night. The camp settled down to routine, keeping fit while awaiting the next call of war. Daily scores of soldiers from various battalions came to visit Hori. Many had seen him in action, while many others had heard all manner of stories about him. Hori had become a hero dog and accepted all honors with becoming dignity posing for dozens of cameras. Dier Sunid district appeared interesting for the first few weeks, the countryside of yellow sand contrasting with green orange groves, hedged by cultivated cactus. The Arabs, too, were much more colorful than those we knew in Egypt, but did not appeal in the least to Hori, who chased them on sight. They were strictly forbidden the camp, for they were notorious thieves. The soldiers had to chain their rifles to the tent poles. Despite the closest watch, the prowlers would come, silent as the night itself, 
and worked their way into the tents. They had even been known to unchain the rifles and get away with them, making not the faintest sound to awaken the sleepers. At last a lamp had to be left burning in the tents all night, while one occupant of each tent must remain awake on watch. Here the rebels were greatly envied by every other tent, for we all could and did sleep, the sleep of the just. No Arab, no matter how expert, could sneak within many yards of our tent, let alone right into it. The watchful wog dog saw to that. Hori was no longer content to bark. He never challenged now, but simply flew at any Arab he saw and used his needle-sharp teeth. The village of Dier Sunid lay some half-mile from camp. It was strictly out of bounds. We must visit it some time, declared Murchie. From the main Tel Aviv Gaza road, the village was screened by a lovely orange grove. It was completely enclosed by a high mud and straw wall, with apparently one little gate. The dark and sinister mysteries it might hold fascinated us very much. Sergeant Popa made it all the more alluring for he had seen hectic times here during the 1914-18 war. The wily old bird knew where our thoughts often strayed, and he enlivened them by dark hints of dusky maids dancing in shimmering veils to the weird wailing of native music. The day came when dawn and feathers and I seized an opportunity to investigate for ourselves. You're staying right here, my fine lad, declared Don to the protesting Hori as he tied him to the tent pole. What a lovely time he'd have in that village, laughed Feathers. He'd cause a commotion we mightn't care to remember, declared Don. Right you are, he's tied securely. We stepped out of the tent and innocently sauntered through the camp. Once in the shelter of the orange grove, we hurried on. We emerged from the grove by the wall and through the gate could catch a glimpse of a narrow winding street. Shrouded figures passed by now and then. A loaded camel lurched by. Feathers beckoned and we stepped through the gate. We started warily down the street, hemmed in by mud houses. Archways opened out in the inner wall, which led into tiny yards in front. Arabs passed us, staring. Urchins played amongst the fowls and donkeys in the street. Few soldiers have been through here, judging by these staring eyes, I remarked. A nasty place for a brawl, declared Don, to be bailed up in this rabbit warren. Don't forget where the gate is, warned Feathers, but all seemed peaceful enough, although we did not quite like the crowd of Arabs now, silently following. Some of the urchins now screeched at our very heels, demanding bakshish, bakshish, well, said Feathers with a sniff, I don't know so much about this alluring exotic perfume the dark maidens are supposed to use. The village does hum a bit, I agreed. Smells horrible enough to stop a watch, said Don. A murderous-looking fellow stopped us as we were passing a shadowed doorway. Can can, he growled and beckoned us to follow him. Nothing doing, I shrugged. Cognac, very clean cognac, he inquired, and offered a bottle of filthy-looking liquid. Finish money, George, I replied. 
cognac good, he growled. Five hundred mils. Australia, plenty money. Finnish money, George, I answered deliberately as we walked on. But now the urchins had withdrawn a little. Catcalls followed us. A stone whizzed by Feather's head. We faced about, a little uneasy at the crowd, now between us and the gate. Tough-looking Arabs were behind the urchins urging them on. Stones began to fly. I'd like a crack at that big black sod urging the Arabs on over there, remarked Feathers. Looks like we'll have to fight our way out, said Don. Come on, better not waste a moment, I suggested. As we stepped towards them, a shower of stones greeted us. It looked ugly. All of a sudden, the crowd glanced behind, then surged toward us with a yell. We thought they were charging us, but heard the squawking of fowls, followed by Hori's bark. Hori to the rescue, laughed Don. Hooray! Squawks and yells answered Don as three brang donkeys and the Arabs flew past us down the narrow street, the little dog snapping at their heels. Hori certainly had timed his blitz at the critical moment. It was staggering how those grown-up ruffians and the mob of urchins panicked on the instant. Perhaps it never entered their heads that the tiny dog was not the forerunner of an angry Australian guard with fixed bayonets. As Hori sighted us, his enthusiasm became fanatical, and he dashed past to complete the rout. I raced after him, but he ignored me to concentrate on Arabs scrambling to squeeze into a narrow doorway. The shrieks as he snapped their bare heels could hardly have been louder had the village been put to the sword. Now's our time, laughed Dawn, as I snatched up the pup. Quickly, we beat a retreat, passing two Arabs with bleeding noses. One had rushed out of a doorway, as the other rushed in. But we gained the gate and leaped outside, with Hori struggling to get back to the village and into the fight again. We were very relieved and enjoyed a good laugh all the way back to the camp.